The Unshackled Waves, episode 258. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. Now, for many years, Melbourne has been seen as the home of Antifa and other Marxist extremist groups, and to a lesser degree, Sydney. But now the city of Brisbane has been grinding to a halt due to the repeated disruptive protests of extreme climate change activist groups, which involve blocking traffic, including supergluing themselves to the road. The target of these protests has been against the Adani Carmichael coal mine in central Queensland, the Palaszczuk Labor state government recently reluctantly approved the mine after the Liberal National Party vote surged in the just past federal election after they ran on a pro Adani platform. These protesters haven't been deterred by any of the fines and other punishments they've received from the courts. Therefore, there has been a push for uh, stronger punishments to be handed out to those who deliberately disrupt uh, major public places and block traffic. Brisbane has also been an unlikely battleground in their fight to save democracy in Hong Kong with the Chinese Communist Party backed Confucius Institute at the University of Queensland becoming a point of tension with the local students there and the university administration with student union politics further inflaming the situation. To discuss the march of the extremist into Brisbane, I welcome back to the show our Antifa and far left expert, associate editor of The Unshackled, Lucas Roses. Lucas, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me too. Now, you've been following this takeover of Brisbane by these climate extremists, uh, publishing close to uh, 10 articles on it. There have been numerous disruptive protests in the city of Brisbane. I've lost track of them all. Uh, I'm not sure if you've got them all <laughs> written down somewhere. <laughs> but it all started with this global climate action group called Extinction Rebellion. They've staged disruptive protests in in London. They have quite extreme proposals. Their first goal is to have various government authorities declare climate emergencies and they want zero emissions by 2025. So they were the original organisers of these Brisbane protests, which of course are centred around opposing the Adani Col Carmichael mine in central Queensland, which the people of Queensland overwhelmingly voted for in the, the May federal election. Yes, that's true. The Extinction Rebellion stuff originally came out of Europe, specifically Britain, and it does have some very extremist hardcore elements in there, but overall it's much like what happened with things like the anti-globalisation protests in the late 90s and the, um, the Occupy movements that happened about a decade ago, in that the, it's just more or less a, a small hardcore that has attracted a larger group of activists to a more of a brand name than anything else. The people who've mostly been attracted to this in Australia are actually not that numerous. Uh, they are very dedicated. They usually come out of the established environmental movements, some of the more extreme fringes of the environmental movements, and uh, some of them actually uh, in Australia come from some parts of the vegan movement as well, uh, more the militant vegan movement. But overall, they don't, they're not as organised as some of the more far-left extremist groups that are in Australia, and I uh, believe they're being manipulated by them. What they've uh, done in Brisbane, and there's actually, because they're such a decentralised group, they're brand new, they've pretty much sprung out of nowhere, and they've been a, sort of a coalescing, coalescing of uh, various other groups that have come together across the country. You've had a, a distinct split between the, the Brisbane branch of the, uh, they call themselves XR, so the Extinction Rebellion, and the other groups, because with their constant blocking of traffic in Brisbane, um, you people have seen stuff with being glued to the road, with the guys putting themselves in a canoe, all actions that take pretty much a dozen or at most two dozen or three dozen people are involved in these things. They've really quite created quite a, a backlash of negative publicity against themselves. And a lot of the other extension opinion groups across Australia are sort of trying to find less confrontational ways to do that. But the Brisbane ones are being encouraged by some of the other extremists that they've attracted to into doing the sorts of things that we saw yesterday as of recording, so yesterday in Brisbane, and um, with the uh, Rebellion Day 
as they called it, where over 70 um, people have been deliberately arrested. They uh, deliberately blocked the streets in front of police after being warned so that they would be arrested as a form of civil disobedience. And you had various representatives from various extreme left groups that have nothing to do with Extinction Rebellion and nothing to do with any of their stated sort of goals except a shared commitment to the idea that capitalism is economically unsustainable and needs to be destroyed in some way. Well, they're also encouraged by the, the mainstream media who gleefully report, oh, look at these noble climate activists. They, they have all this attention from the mainstream media, even though there are two dozen of them. And it's interesting that uh, when, uh, when uh, obviously the recent Patriot rallies haven't been very well attended, the mainstream media mock them, but mainstream media, these climate protests with two dozen people they're they're glowingly reporting on them and i remember a seven news uh story where they actually went to one of the climate activist training uh sessions where they were t instructing them how to block traffic how to break the law oh yeah and some of those sessions well it's to the first point with the press i think there's no sort of um any sort of ambiguity about what the uh, the attitude of the average journalist is towards these people and towards their cause. I think they're fully, fully in support and that pretty much only the only time they actually put a negative spin on it is when the particular journalists know that their audience wants it that way. So more sort of the, the tabloid news um, sort of shows, the, the current affairs, that sort of stuff. But even there, yeah, they went to um, the actual... Uh, some of the commercial television stations have gone and filmed inside their planning meetings. And those planning meetings, as it later turned out, were being held in the offices, the taxpayer-funded offices of uh, uh, Willem Gabba, Brisbane Greens councillor, Jonathan Sree, who at the extinction, at the Rebellion Day uh, protest yesterday went into a freestyle rap uh, sitting in front of the entire crowd whilst dressed in absurdly tight pants. He's this very strange character. But uh, even a, a Labor MP, a state Labor MP, has come out and condemned Jonathan Sree for this and condemned the Liberal Party for doing deals with the Greens that have allowed them to take uh, formerly Labor council seats in the Brisbane Council. So it's uh, all wrong uh, in that particular regard. And the Greens Federal Senator, Larissa Waters, she was there as well, giving legitimacy as well. Oh, yeah, the Greens have been associated with these protests um, and with other similar protests from other groups we'll get to in a second uh, all over Australia over the course of the last six months or so going back before the federal election. Uh, Larissa Waters has spoken at, I think this is a couple now, of either Extinction Rebellion or other extremist anti adani groups um, at their protests. Jonathan Street. Yeah, <laughs> gives them places to organise and shows up at all of their events. Of course, he's well known for having a long history with uh, various extremist groups in the West End of Brisbane. Um, you've got uh, the head of the ACT Greens. He's spoken at one of these um, protests in front of an Extinction Rebellion flag. You've got Sarah Hanson Young, who's been associated with some of these um, protests and even more extreme ones than what uh, the more extreme organisations than what Extinction Rebellion are and has spoken at their organising meetings. And of course in Victoria, the Greens are well on board as well. There hasn't really been um, any sort of a backlash or any sort of uh, thing pointed out that the Greens are associating with these extremists in the media because as we've talked about before, the media is inherent biases. Well, the only media outlet, apart from yourself, that's exposed these people is the, the Courier Mail, the Brisbane Murdoch tabloid, and they did a big expose on one of the, the climate uh, protesters, Eric Serge Herbert, who yeah. uni, <laughs> uni dropout, and it was revealed he lives at his parents' mansion on the, the Sunshine Coast. He's been arrested five times, and he was before the uh, Brisbane Magistrates Court uh, recently, where he requested that he, he was going to be sentenced to community service, but he was worried that that might disrupt his life and requested to do it in in Brisbane. So quite a lot of uh, demands there. Yeah, his sisters are really hot too. He's um, a triplet and his two twin sisters are absolutely gorgeous. They're international models with uh, 1.5 million followers on Instagram or something like that. 
so yeah, he definitely from the um, from the stereotypical sort of uh, hippie university dropout lefty um, socioeconomic and cultural and educational background. <laughs> it's just like you really couldn't make a better stereotype. It's completely understandable that the Drew Mail and the Barry Mail jumped all over that because it just confirms everybody's uh, everybody can get, like, the stereotype everyone has in their brain of what these spoiled little brats are actually about. Um, interestingly enough, when he was charged, I think it was the fifth time, he actually was part of his bail conditions was that he was banned from the CBD of Brisbane. Where yesterday he showed up in the CBD of Brisbane, and there were, I, as far as I know, he wasn't arrested. He was giving interviews to adoring uh, journalists who were stuffing cameras and some microphones in his face. Also on the bail conditions, something has just come out this morning is that the 70 or so people who were arrested yesterday by police um, after deliberately getting themselves arrested have been given... This hasn't come out in the media yet. Uh, hopefully it'll be out on the Unshackled site by the time this uh, show comes out. Have been given bail con- fairly strict bail conditions. It took like five goes for Eric Herbert to get his bail conditions uh, banned on the CBD. These people, pretty much all first-timers, have been given, from what the reports I've heard, have been given um, bans from the CBD for the next couple of weeks until their court dates in late August, which has actually changed the route for the large protest that's being held on Friday, which would be much bigger than the one that was yesterday, and um, that route is now going to be a march across the borderline of that bail condition so that they can then sort of celebrate the um, 70 or so people there and hold them up and tell them what heroes they are as a part of the process on Friday evening at 5 p.m. Even though they're occasionally arrested, charged and tried at the, the local magistrate's court, they're, they're undeterred at all. I mean, we, we, we just talked about uh, Herbert's uh, punishment. It's pretty light if, I mean, the idea of the justice system is to discourage uh, further commitment of crimes. And I know that the Liberal National Opposition Leader, Deb Frecklington, she's been pretty vocal that uh, we need uh, tougher penalties against uh, these disruptive climate protesters and the full force of the law needs to be applied against them. It seems to, to me that, because well, we know that the Anastasia Palaszczuk Labor government reluctantly approved the Adani mine, and of course we know who the, the real uh, power in the government is, is Jackie Trad, the member for for South Brisbane, oh, yeah. which takes in West End, which is pretty much the Brisbane Antifa Marxist zone, and of course yeah, she went to the New Town in Sydney or Brunswick. Yeah, and she uh, was previously saying before the mine was approved that our oh, miners they should uh, should reskill, and so she's representing a lot of these climate activists. So is there? Is there an enabling happening on by the, the Queensland Labor government secretly that they don't want to come down too hard on these protesters they secretly agree with? I think it's more of a tendency um, and inertia in the system. There's a lot of people, like you were talking about, the West End, the inner city people, both in Melbourne and Sydney and in Brisbane. There is an entire class, a socioeconomic, educational class. Nick Cater, the um, writer for The Australian, once did a study on it and pointed it out brilliantly. This is where the journalists live. Uh, this is where they socialise, where their friends are. They hold the same sorts of values as what these people do. And a great many magistrates and lawyers also live in these areas and also have been educated in the same educational institutions by the same uh, lecturers. Uh, they, the inertia in the system is in their favour. And I think that the fact that they've started actually slapping bail conditions on people who are first-time protesters and first-time being arrested um, shows that the Queensland state government is starting to see this, particularly Palaszczuk in her struggles with Jackie Trad, is starting to see this as a negative. That um, further divisions within the coalition of the government when she's currently looking towards re-election uh, is something that's unfavourable. And so it may be time to uh, encourage the kiddies not to block traffic so much. Because even though blocking traffic like that makes you a hero to certain demographics of the population, to the vast majority of Australians, there is nothing that enrages them more. I mean, you only have to look at the reaction online on any news site, from the ABC through to commercial television stations. 
right, on any social media platform. All right? There are lots of people who congratulate them, but the vast majority of normal people, and in normal, apolitical, maybe centre-left, centre-right, the vast majority of mainstream Australia hates the idea of people blocking roads for their own selfish political reasons. I mean, they all live in one seat, pretty much South Brisbane, out of 93 seats in the, the state of Queensland's parliament. I mean, that just gives you an idea of just how unrepresentative they are. Yeah, uh, but that concentration, being right around the centre of political power, being right around the centre of what is now sort of the cultural centre, in mean, a lot of ways the wealth centre of the modern city, the modern metropolis, is how these people have managed to have such an outsized impact on society as a whole. It's more like their ideas, their preoccupations, their concerns are always on the front page of the newspaper. Well, no wonder there's the uh, secessionist North Queensland movement. I mean, that's where the, the mines and the agricultural well, are... regions are, are based. And let's not remember that federal Labor, they hold no seats outside the Brisbane CBD. Yeah, the seat of Townsville, um, Labor Party, after the Malcolm Turnbull election in 2016, held the seat of Townsville by 36 votes. I think the swing against them was somewhere in the realms of 6,000. So, yeah, now it's safe seat. And that was one of the more left-leaning seats in North Queensland. So, yeah, it's um, the differences between North and South in Queensland only uh, are being exacerbated. They're only getting larger. Now, of course, Extension Rebellion, they're the, the group that have started these climate protests in, in Brisbane that have spread to, to other cities. But of course, they're the local socialist and Marxist group like to be part of this because they see the, the climate change movement as a way to achieve their goals of deindustrializing the West and bringing down capitalism. And so they've formed pretty much what is a front group uh, uni Students for Climate Justice. Yeah, Uni Students for Climate Justice um, started up about March uh, in regards to getting... It was a vehicle for socialist alternative to try and organise just uh, a way to get university students to go to the high school school strikes that have been organised by wider sort of uh, climate change groups across the world. Um, and it was a considerable success, so they decided to run with it and they've uh, managed to build up quite a bit of momentum. It's like uh, Extinction Rebellion held a protest yesterday, which is Tuesday in case this comes out later, and they managed to get, out of a thousand people who said they were going to come, they managed to get about 250, and that's probably being generous. But about 70 of those were so hardcore that they were willing to actually get themselves arrested. All right, the socialist alternative backed Uni Students for Climate Justice will be holding a nationwide uni student walkout on Friday afternoon and Friday evening to shut down Melbourne, Sydney, um, Brisbane, I believe also Adelaide, Perth and Canberra. That's the extent of their reach. They've also managed to get endorsements from multiple Greens politicians, including ones that have traditionally been against Marxist groups like Bob Brown. They've managed to get endorsements from the young ALP groups inside uh, the National Union of Students, which has given them massive amounts of resources and legitimacy to push this out, to allow them to preach and then promote this protest and this message in actual university classrooms. They really, they have so much more reach. Extinction Rebellion is a bunch of Greenies who genuinely think that by blocking traffic they're going to bring down the entire capitalist system. Socialist alternative or a Trotskyist group, a revolutionary Trotskyist group who really, their end game is to recruit as many activists as possible and to use those activists to overthrow the government. Um, usually the Trotskyists want to do it by going through infiltration in the union movement, but there's, that's a whole a very long story. So we won't go into that, but yeah. Socialist Alternative is an extremist group. They're um, Marxists of the Trotskyist mould. They want to transform Australia into a version of the early Soviet Union before Stalin came along. I believe that even as murderous as it was, the early Soviet Union was a good thing. And uh, only later did it degenerate. Only did later did it become state capitalist in the Socialist Alternative um, lexicon. So real, in their mind, real communism has never been tried, ultimately, to sum it up. So they want to go. 
and have another go again. Now, every single, you know, the front group, they use uni students for climate justice. Every single uh, spokesperson, every single uh, major leader and every single organiser of it, and most of the speakers have all been known members of social solidarities. At all the uni students for climate justice events, there have been large, prominent social solidarity banners. Craig Kelly, the MP, um, House, federal MP, House from Western Sydney, has noticed this himself and has put it up on his Facebook page numerous times, including of yesterday's protest of lots of social solidarity banners. Social solidarity um, is using Extinction Rebellion because they have international sort of um, brand power, just sort of as like a little flag to wave around whilst their much larger front organisation is sitting underneath. And that's what we're going to probably see on Friday, a much larger mobilisation of people than what we did on Tuesday. Uh, if anyone's read all of your articles on the anti Adani climate protests mentioning Socialist Alternative, you'll see the same names over and over again. And even going back to your articles on Socialist Alternative involved in other extremist activism, you'll see the same names over and over again. Yeah, these people are well-known activists. They're even I think the Brisbane Times actually mentioned one of the activists in uh, Brisbane, Carl Jackson, because he's extremely well known and, and named him as being a member of Socialist Alternative, because he's, he's extremely well known as being an extremist activist. He was the guy who confronted Bob Catter. He's the guy who attacked, organised the attacks on the One Nation annual general meeting at the Ridges Hotel in South Bay. He's the guy who tried to break up the Pauline Hanson's uh, Senate launch, I think in the was the 2019 or 2016 election, one of the two, but organised a mob to try and attack that, which had to be driven off by police and security again. He's in everything, over and over again, at the front of all the protests, waving a red flag and proudly proclaiming himself to be a member of Socialist Alternative. He's even written an online guide to why people should be socialists. There's no real sort of uh, mystery about this guy. His picture is everywhere. Everyone knows who he is, but yet the media never picks up on it. The same with um, Catherine Robertson. She's been specifically moved by a socialist alternative from Monash in Melbourne up to um, Brisbane to help sort of grow the socialist alternative movement up there, the socialist alternative branch in Brisbane. And she's been very successful at that, particularly by reaching out to environmental groups, like uh, one of them is called Movement Against Destruction, which is a small group of about 12 people, um, with the other sort of environmental groups on campus, which she sort of rolled into this uni students for climate justice. Uh, these activists are all there. And of course, Catherine has uh, Catherine's managed to show up to all these events where Extinction Rebellion people were getting arrested, but uh, only got arrested the first time herself yesterday. She's always been more uh, cheering on before that and somehow managing to be arrested herself. <laughs> but there's footage, I believe, from the ABC of her getting arrested yesterday, so hopefully she enjoys her bail conditions and hopefully gets a nice big fine. Now, they've been pretty busy, the Socialist Alternative, up in Brisbane because they've been involved in a, another major protest uh, movement. Uh, this is at the, the University of Queensland, which amazingly has become a battlefront for the, the pro-Hong Kong uh, democracy movement against the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. This all started when, for some reason, supporters of the, the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, attacked uh, pro-Hong Kong students, throwing punches, and it was, it was quite incredible. And this spurred a group called Transparency for UQ, which was opposing the Chinese Communist Party a party-backed uh, Confucius Institute at the, the university, which the university administration has been keen to defend and suppress opposition to. Yeah, well, um, the, the UQ one is uh, quite funny, actually. I mean, not funny in that you've got people being um, urged by the government of a foreign country to attack dissidents on a campus in Australia, but it's, it's funny in the um, sort of relationship of Socialist Alternative to the world. Socialist Alternative on UQ is mostly run by a young girl called uh, Priya B, who originally comes from Canberra, I believe, or at least started her university career at ANU in any case, and is now up at UQ. Socialist Alternative moves their activists around from university to university quite a lot, and in increasing numbers in later, in latter years. Now, what happened was that you had the pro- Chinese government students attacking the anti-Chinese government students, we'll put it as simply as that, and um, there was a, quite a bit of support for the anti 
Chinese government students by a lot of the local political groups, everyone pretty much from the, the young lids to the young labor to the greens to all that sort of stuff. We were firmly on the side of the um, Hong Kong protesters. Now, towards the end of the, that particular round, the one that made all the news, um, Priya D actually jumped up, grabbed the megaphone and uh, essentially said that because she's an elected councillor on um, for UQ Student Union, she um, was there for like, representing them and made a speech and all that sort of stuff. And after that, social stops out of being, uh, as they are, ultimate opportunists and very good at it, should always uh, appreciate skill, they um, pretty much tried to take over the entire thing. They loaned their PA system to the Hong Kong students, when the, the pro-Hong Kong students, when they were um, holding one of their rallies. And they more or less tried to move in and force out anyone that they didn't like from all any of the organising committees. And this is where the transparency for UQ one comes in because they didn't let social alternatives take over. So Priya started threatening people. I believe the threats are online. They've been screenshots have been put around, so it's not particularly controversial to say. Um, pretty much, they threw a gigantic tantrum about not being allowed to be in charge. And uh, since then, they, when the um, actual transparency for UQ rally went along, went ahead, they started calling it uh, racist, nationalist, neo-Nazi, accused them of waving Australian flags, um, accused, them, <laughs> accused Tibetan monks of promoting an atmosphere of white nationalism. It... Um, they really weren't spare. I mean, everyone who is in the UQ sort of contingent of socialist alternative, which is like people like Priya D and people like uh, Tom Bramble, who taught uh, industrial relations there for many years, and was a long-term socialist alternative activist. Uh, <laughs> um, they, it was quite uh, amusing just how much they went. No, they brought in people um, online, at least, to fight the battles, uh, people like Duncan Hart and uh, Carl Carl Roberts and Catherine Robertson, who are more based around um, uh, QUT, and just, yeah, just tried to flood the zone, but uh, they really annoyed a lot of people, because uh, pretty much coming in and screaming racist at everyone, because they won't let you control every protest that happens, and they won't let you sell your newspaper at every single one and try and turn into a recruiting opportunity for your particular revolutionary Marxist group, doesn't tend to make you a very popular person. Socialist alternative has annoyed a lot of, and most people in this protest were, of course, lefties, um, members of the student union. And uh, it's amazing how many lefties Socialist Alternative has managed to piss off over the years. And of course, their disinformation campaign didn't work. I mean, there wasn't mainstream media reports saying that this was a, uh, a racist, a white supremacist rally against uh, Chinese people at uh, UQ. But they did manage to make uh, transparency for UQ panic and disinvite uh, Liberal Democrats National President Andrew Cooper because he's the organiser for the CPAC <laughs> conference. Yeah, I love that. Andrew Cooper. The uh, Liberal Democratic Party is apparently a neo-Nazi now. He's a, an old right neo-Nazi. <laughs> he must be thrown out of uh, everything. And just the fact that some of his speech was, even after he was disinvited, some of his speech was um, read out by another person was enough to make this a neo-Nazi demonstration and uh, socialist alternative. Uh, really, to them, pretty much everyone to the right of Malcolm Turnbull is a neo-Nazi. And once you realise that, a lot more of their behaviour starts to make sense. That was absolutely, um, yeah. And that, that this information did work to an extent. Priya D was quoted in the New York Times saying that racist insults were being yelled out at um, Chinese students by evil white Australian students at, one of, at their first protest. She only made that quote after she'd been uh, told she wasn't going to be dominating the second protest. Um, and she, that same sort of quote came about in the, um, well, some, depending on whether it's the English or the Chinese language, depending on whether it's pro-regime or not sometimes, the um, South China Morning Post is also doing that. So I've got international, Priya B was quoted internationally in large newspapers with a very wide distribution trying to slander a single little protest that was happening with a few full of young people and a lone couple of Tibetan people waving their flags protesting against a totalitarian government. 
<laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's even more funny because you, when you have studied social stocks and stuff, they've never been a fan of the Chinese government. So turning around now and attacking a protest against the Chinese government is just, it's the level of uh, Hitler and Stalin signing the non-aggression pact <laughs> before World War II. It's uh, the level of sort of uh, cognitive dissonance that these people have, the level of sort of discipline to turn on a dime and uh, march lockstep ideologically and never think for themselves. And he's actually a little bit scary, but funny at the same time. Well, they had to go to the international press because uh, they didn't know the, the full story, whether the local press did. And of course, uh, Australia is, well, everyone loves to call Australia uh, racist, especially well, in New York Times has done it multiple times before. I mean, they've published stuff by Waleed Ali uh, decrying uh, Australia. So they just, of course, would have eaten that up. Yeah, it's become a bit of a favourite place for sort of Australian uh, lefty upper upper class people to dish on their own country, isn't it? The New York Times. It's just like, it, I think it's just the prestige of the old name that it's got, the old grey lady. Now, given that the socialist alternative this, as you said, it was pretty much a massive tantrum where even, because uh, this rally against the Confucius Centre, there were there were Greens involved in it as well. And of course... Uh, Andrew Bartlett was there, right? former senator for the Greens, current convener for the state Greens, was speaking there at a rally that they say was Australian nationalist, racist, and had an atmosphere of white nationalism. And then Andrew Bartlett. With his with his hippie dad like grey um, ponytail hanging out and his big gut, the sort of the stereotype of the middle aged hippie. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's doing that now. Oh, it's just, their um, their passion for attacking their ideological enemies on the left is uh, almost more virulent than their attacks on their ideological enemies on the right. And uh, anyone who's studied the history of Trotskyists knows that that's pretty typical, to be honest. Now, has that caused any tension between the Greens and the social alternative in the the other protest movement that we were talking about just before, the the climate anti Adani? Given that there has been some enabling and complicitness on the Greens in supporting uni students for climate justice. Yeah, a little bit. But the thing is, is that the um, the local sort of Brisbane Greens have always been associated with various trends of extreme left stuff, and they're pretty much sharp. The, the equivalent of the opening of an extreme left envelope. People like Jonathan Sree were, in any case. He's, um, Sree has always been more associated with the Unite group, which uh, started off as a split from the Socialist Alliance back uh, a few years ago and has sort of coalesced itself as a place where um, non socialist alternative Marxists and anarchists of a slightly less doctrinaire sort of bent can associate with each other and. He's more a part of that scene, and it's a very West End sort of um, dominated scene. They've got their, their little meeting house and all that sort of stuff down there, and they do a lot of their work down there as well. So I don't think, like, Sri in particular is bright enough to really sort of pick up on the differences between his new friends. The fact that the UQ Greens came out and denounced the rally as well, even though the convener of the state Greens was speaking at it, is an interesting touch. <laughs> Uh, it really, it really shows that the um, look, the UQ Greens did this, and the Aboriginal Office of UQ did this as well because Priya told them to, essentially because the Socialist Alternative boss at the place told them to, and a lot of their stuff relies on her. The fact that the Socialist Alternative are inside the NUS, and because they all vote as a bloc, very with great discipline, they are able to have a say over the allocation of resources and that sort of stuff. They do have considerable power within the university system. I know it's a genuine thing, particularly when um, quite a few of the NTEU, that's the uh, University uh, Faculty Union, at UQ, a lot of their representatives are actually very far left themselves. One of them actually wrote a book called The, um, the Radical History of Brisbane, which if you've been in a left -wing, far left-wing bookshop recently, they have a series of these, Radical History of Brisbane, Radical History of Sydney, Radical History of Melbourne. Radical History of Melbourne was written by Jill and Jeff Sparrow, who founded Socialist Alternative. Radical History of um, Sydney was written by um, one, a former Communist Party of Australia theorist, and um, the Radical History of Brisbane, the guy, he's a librarian at UQ. He's, uh, his name escapes me, but he's pretty much of the same bent. 
So that's the, um, the the faculty union are very sympathetic to social stocks earlier. The, um, the Greens on YouTube and all of the small departments will line up with social stocks even when it means attacking their own party, which is really quite strange. Now, as you mentioned, there's going to be a national uh, climate protest on on Friday because these anti Adani uh, protests have spilled over to, to other cities, uh, Sydney, Canberra, Adelaide, and of course, Melbourne. And yeah, we, we've seen that, well, in Brisbane at least, they're, they're undeterred by the uh, arrests and, and charges and they don't seem to care that they're pissing the the silent majority of, or as uh, Scott Morrison calls them, the, the quiet Australians, is there going to be any end in sight? Because it seems like this massive tantrum against a coal mine that, well, the people that live next to the coal mine want, it's, they're, they're, they're just going to continue to basically scream until they, they think somehow they're, they're going to get their way. Yeah, it's the, the Darling mine has almost nothing to do with the way they're doing this. Um, this is the uh, Uni Students for Climate Justice is a uh, social stop sanity front. Social stop sanity sees this, and they've said so openly in their newspaper, that they see this as being like the Occupy movement, like the anti war movement against the Iraq war, like the uh, anti globalization movement of the late 1990s. This is a way to build momentum to help break down the institutions of society and, most importantly, to recruit more members to their group to make it stronger, to get more access, more cadre, as they call it. Um, now, they're pretty much they're trying to build this up into a bit of momentum to create um, a huge protest at a mining conference, a uh, Victorian State Government mining conference. Uh, fund, sorry, Victorian State Government supported mining conference is happening in Melbourne in October. Um, they were in the Herald Sun just the other day. Uh, Sarah Garnham has been a long-term social alternative activist, has lived in multiple cities and done work for them uh, all throughout the National Union of Students and um, also theoretical work in their um, theoretical uh, journal, Marxist Left Review. Um, she did an interview with the Herald Sun where she said that they are going to try and create a new S11, as in the S11 riots of September 2000 where 10,000 people shut down Crown Casino, attacked the police. Yeah, I, v I vaguely remember police. that. So it was, yeah, and vile. They trapped the Western Australian Premier in, trapped the Western Australian Premier in his car and uh, let down his tyres and started trying to tip his car over on a bridge. Um, the tab, like, had the usual urine-filled balloons, marbles under police horses' hooves, that sort of stuff. That's what they want to do in October, and that's what they're trying to build momentum towards, that mining conference there. There's actually an interesting article up on their website talking about how they see using the environmental movement to move towards Marxism, a Marxist society, a totalitarian socialist society and how they say that what Trotsky, to go a bit in depth, what Trotsky used to call a transitional program, you give people a list of demands that can't actually be um, fulfilled under capitalism. Things like 100% renewables. And then you force them to um, see that the only solution is a revolution. Well, you instruct them that the only solution is a revolution and you get them on your side that way. So it's, um, that's, that's sort of their aim. That's their goal. They're not going to stop until the momentum dies out. And no, that's it. They're not going to stop until the momentum dies out because they have no reason to. It doesn't matter if the Adani mine, if the Adani mine falls over for financial reasons or whatever, that's good from their perspective. They can claim victory and use that for more momentum for the next one. Um, but if the Adani mine doesn't fall over, well, then they've just proven to the people who, all the uni students that they've gone out of class and who they've been instructing and recruiting, they've just proven to all of them that under a capitalist system, uh, things like a daily can't be stopped. So it's win win for them, as long as they can keep the momentum going as long as possible. Well, I think the best thing that we can do and what you've been doing is maintain the, the scrutiny on who these protesters really are and expose them and make sure that the the mainstream media portraying them as heroes we just need to 
keep pointing out how how false that is and yes it's good that there there are uh, mainstream media outlets such as the the Korea Mail uh, exposing uh, these people and I think if because this is how they get away with a lot of it they're they're not scrutinized and so I think that if the the public pressure is kept upon them then I think that is going to have a, a detrimental effect on obviously uh, recruitment and their PR well, it's right. There's, well, we're talking about the Institute for Climate Justice. Uh, they've managed to build up the massive momentum. Well, not massive, but it's a considerable amount of momentum that they have because they've been able to ally with the young ALP left, young ALP right to a certain extent, and the rest of the National Union of Students and other people within there. They've been able to get people on their side within the media, people on their side within the Greens. Uh, constantly pointing out that they want to overthrow the government and bring in a totalitarian state uh, does help to make those sorts of people think twice about cooperating with them, particularly if it's publicly well known. Uh, Bob Brown, for instance, has been fighting against Trotskyists inside the Greens since the early 90s when they founded the Greens in the first place. Uh, one of the first actions that Bob Brown was behind was the expulsion of members of the Democratic Socialist Party, which later became Socialist Alliance. Uh, from the Greens, which they had been infiltrating to the point where they'd actually had quite a few of the first Greens candidates were open Trotskyists. Uh, it's a battle that's been going on for a very long time. You can't let the Greens cozy up to the Reds. Right? Even though they hold some sort of similar view, the Greens are not complete nutcases to the same extent. Even though people like to talk about how the Greens are nutcases and how they want 100% renewables, they don't actively want to destroy everything about society so they can try communism again. Most of them, at least. <laughs> Most of the more mainstream ones, and particularly the, the current uh, Greens leadership. Uh, you do need to expose them. They do need to be dragged down into sunlight because it really is the only thing that's going to beat them, the only thing that's going to slow them down because currently they just keep getting stronger and stronger. Well, keep up the exposés, Lucas, and thanks for enlightening our audience about what's really going on with these extremists taking over Brisbane, and uh, we look forward to uh, some of your future articles. Thank you very much, Tim. Glad to be here. And that's the show for today. I plan to produce more single-issue themed shows with experts on these areas instead of just the normal news review shows, just to provide a bit more variety and extra analysis to our shows, so stay tuned for those. Don't forget to check out the latest Detonation episodes on the Unshackled YouTube channel hosted by my colleague Steel Archer, and of course The Uncuckables, our joint production with XYZ and The Rational Rise is live again this Thursday night at 8.30pm Melbourne time on its dedicated YouTube channel, so make sure you are subscribed to it so you're notified when we go live. Remember to counter the fake news and algorithm manipulations. Use duckdockgo.com for your search needs and Infogalactic for your information needs as an alternative to Wikipedia which seems to be full of disinformation at the moment. There is also free speech social media, which The Unshackled has a presence on. We're on gab.com slash The Unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. We are on mewe.com slash P slash The Unshackled. We also have our growing Telegram channel on the popular encrypted messaging service at t.me slash The Unshackled. Remember that we cannot produce the, the content that we do and reach the audience that we do without your support. And the best form of support is to support us financially. We're on patreon.com slash the unshackled. And we're also on paypal.me slash the unshackled. We have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership, and our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. We also are on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled. And we also have our merchandise for sale at our new online store, which is theunshackled.net slash store. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.